Hi, this is Pastor Dale Capron at Lacey Spring United Methodist Church. I'm glad that you're watching this Bible study video. We're going to finish the book of 1 Thessalonians this week, reading chapter 5 together. And I hope that this chapter, this Bible study, will enhance your spiritual life, encourage you in your walk with Jesus Christ, and help to grow your faith. Let's say a prayer together as we get started. Holy God, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the words that you gave to the Apostle Paul to write down in this letter to the church at Thessalonica. And Lord God, I pray that even though 2,000 years have passed, and so much time and so many changes have occurred, that the church of today can draw wisdom just as the early church did from Paul as he wrote these letters. By your holy name we pray these things. Amen. So chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is another short chapter. It shouldn't take us very long to get through. We'll go verse by verse. And I encourage you to use whatever translation you prefer, whatever copy of the Bible just best suits you. But to read along as I read the words from my Bible, you just follow along in your own translation. So we'll begin at verse 1 of chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Verse 2, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That's a familiar turn of phrase we know from the scripture, that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. Uh, we're familiar with that, probably it's been repeated a good bit. But if they're worrying about uh, what day the Lord will return, when he will come back. Paul tells the church it's something they don't need to concern themselves with. It's not something for us to know. We are not told by God when Jesus will come back, when will he return. I think there are many people in our church today that are still worried about this. It doesn't seem to have gone away. It's been 2,000 years. Obviously, the church has been waiting longer than some of the people in Paul's time expected. Paul may have had contemporaries who thought that Christ was going to return in their lifetimes before they had passed away, before they had fallen asleep. And clearly that's not the case. We live 20 centuries after this church in Thessalonica received this letter. And we're still waiting. We're still waiting on the day of the Lord to come. But as Paul says here to that church in that time and to our church in our time, that it's not our place to know the day and the hour. Verse 3, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now that phrase, peace and security, that was part of the statement, the, the mission statement of the Roman Empire, the Pax Romana, the, the peace brought by the Roman Empire. There is peace and security. Yes, there is a certain kind of peace and security under the Roman Empire, as long as you don't mind being a vassal, as long as you don't mind serving Rome. There is a certain peace and security in that. Uh, the people in Thessalonica may have been referring to that Maybe the peace and security they were talking about came from a different source. Clearly, our peace and security today is not going to be the Roman Empire. They're, they're long gone. But if we think we have peace and security, we're going to be surprised. When the day of the Lord comes, the peace and security we think about is not going to be of much value. Think about in your own life if you think security means like financial stability. That's not going to matter very much when the Lord returns. Or you think about living in a nonviolent area of the world. You praise God that you don't have to deal with very much violence in your neighborhood. That's going to be a minor concern when Jesus comes back. There's going to be a conflict, as the Bible tells us, that evil is going to try one more time to defeat the Christ and fail. But... The Lord's return is not going to be this great peaceful event. It's going to surprise a lot of people. Paul writes about sudden destruction. 
like the labor pains of a pregnant woman, this sudden coming of something uh, impactful, something painful for many. These things will come very quickly. There will be no escape, as he writes. Verse 4, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You are not in darkness. We in the church have been warned that Jesus is going to return. We in the church have the the knowledge given to us by God that he's coming back. And when he returns, a lot of things are going to change. We're not in the darkness. We're not in confusion. We're not in misunderstanding. We may put aside the coming of the day of the Lord. We might not want to think about it very often. But we are aware of it. We've been told. We've been warned. God's word has told us that it's coming. And we should not be surprised whenever it does come. Verse 5, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. And praise God that we are children of light, children of day, not darkness, not nighttime. We are not in the dark. We are not lost. We are not without understanding. But we stand in the light of God. We stand in the light of His holiness. He has included us in His revelation through the Scripture that this is coming and those who stand with Christ will be saved. Verse 6, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Let us not fall asleep on the job. Right? Even though it's been 2,000 years since the early church first was told that Christ was going to return, it's been a very long time, we might be more tempted than they were to kind of fall asleep at the wheel and and say this doesn't matter and nobody knows what's going to happen anyway, so let's set it aside. But instead, Paul is exhorting us to keep awake and to be sober. We don't want to be caught by Jesus Christ in a state of being where we're not on his side, where we're not living by faith, where we're not walking with him. We don't want to be in that situation when he returns and comes back. Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night. and Those who get drunk are drunk at night. Verse 8, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul began his letter to the Thessalonians by commending them for their faith, their love, and their hope. Now he says their breastplate is faith and love and their helmet is hope. So he is clothing them in the attributes that they already have, that they've already established. Since we are not of the night, it's not for us to fall asleep or to become drunk. We are of the day. We are people who live by light. So we should live by faith, hope, and love. And the hope specifically for salvation. The hope of salvation of our souls is the hope that we're talking about in the church. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. (coughs) Excuse me. We are not destined for hell. We are not destined for wrath. We are not destined for punishment. We are destined for salvation. We can turn aside from God's plan and give up and protest and rebel. But God's plan is a plan of salvation, not of punishment. We are not destined for that wrath, but rather destined for salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. And verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So at the end, you know, encourage, 
one another, build one another up. The purpose of the church is to gather together when we are challenged, when our faith is getting a little bit weaker. We come to church, we come to the body, and we're lifted up. We're lifted up by praise hymns that cause us to sing God's praises. We are lifted up by our fellow believers if we're downtrodden, if we're grieving, they support us. We're lifted up by our science school teachers who open God's word. We're lifted up by our preachers that exhort the word of God for us. We are encouraged and built up together. And I firmly believe that by ourselves, all alone, we would be lost. We would be discouraged. We would not know what hope was. But let's go back to verses 9 and 10, particularly 10. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So last week, when we looked at chapter 4, we talked about, was there a special privilege for those who had died before his coming? Because they get to be resurrected when he returns. Do they have a special privilege? You know, or are they less than those who remained alive? That question seemed to be going around in the church. So here it mentions that Jesus already died for us that we might live. He's already done that. He's not going to do that a second time. When he returns in his glory, he doesn't go to the cross a second time. He doesn't die a second time. He has already done the work of dying so that we can live. It doesn't matter if we die before his return or we die, at, you know, if we haven't died when he returns or if we previously died. Either way, either way we live in him by his power. Let's continue to this last section of verses. Uh, these are the last few instructions Paul is going to give as he closes out this first letter to the Thessalonians that we have in our New Testament. Verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Respect those who are among you and are over you and those who admonish you. So respecting the leaders in the church, Paul and his compatriots cannot always be there to guide and direct them. He needs them to follow the leadership of the people who are there at Thessalonica Paul can't come rushing back every time that the church has a, a question or a conflict. You know, he lived in a time where they didn't have cell phones or texting or email or any of that. So he, by the time he got a letter from Thessalonica, if they had some kind of problem, it would be months before he could write them back a letter or arrive in person. So he's telling them to respect their leadership. That needs to be true in our churches today. Not just the pastor, you maybe think, oh, respect the pastor, but respecting those who have been chosen to be our leadership on, on committees or teams, whoever is leading and guiding the church, our Sunday school teachers, whoever is in charge. Uh, they need to be you know, respected, but they need to be lifted up, they need to be supported. You need to pray for them and care for them. Uh, let them know you care about them and are, and are hoping the best for them. Let them know you're going to follow their leadership. Verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So basically be grateful. Be grateful for our, our church leaders and not complaining, not trying to break them down or, or sort of work away at their respect or, or their leadership, but supporting them. Be at peace among yourselves. That's how verse 13 ends. Be at peace among yourselves. A church that is at war with itself, a church where the members are fighting and forming sides and disagreeing, it can't accomplish the work of Christ. Not that Christ can't use any church to reach new people, but if people are encouraged to come to a church and led by God's Spirit to come, and they see infighting, they see disagreements, they see petty arguments, they're not going to grow in their faith. 
they're going to walk back out the door and go back, go to another church or, or, or go back to not going to church at all. So the church needs to be at peace among ourselves. It means that when we disagree, because we will disagree, we will have church meetings where we don't agree on something, something important or something not important. We will have different opinions. We'll have different ideas. When the meeting is over, when a decision has been made, we've all got to follow it. Maybe it's not the, the plan you wanted. Maybe it's not the idea you supported. But if it's your church, if you're a member at Lacey Spring United Methodist Church or any other congregation, if you're a member of the church and your membership vows, you said you would support this congregation. If the church leadership has decided to go in a particular direction, as a member of the church, you are to support them in the decision that was made, even if it's not your own, even if you spoke against it. Once the, the decision is made, it's time, it's time to get on board. Verse 14, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Admonishing the idle, encouraging those that aren't participating to participate more, to get more involved. Encouraging the faint-hearted, those that are worried or those that are fearful, to give them a little extra encouragement. Helping the weak, the, the strong, supporting those that are not as strong. Being patient with everybody. We need that in the church. Local churches have so many different personality types, so many different ideas and so many different opinions. We need to be patient with everybody. Be patient with your pastor who is learning people's names and trying to guide and direct the church into the future. Be patient with visitors that are coming and not pushing them to become members too quickly. Be patient maybe with the person that you disagreed with at the last meeting and, and just trying to put those things behind you. But a lot of this is sharing, right? Admonishing the idle, those that are working, are lifting up those that are maybe less involved. Encouragement for the faint-hearted and help for the weak. It just means that any time in the church, whatever's going on, when somebody's going through something, we pull together and we gather up our resources and we help. Right? So when someone in the church is going through one of those rough times of their lives and they maybe they just need to be supported right now and not be in leadership and not be giving of themselves, but just to be carried by those that are able to do so, those that have come together and are supporting the church. Verse 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. I'm a little concerned that Paul has to write this to the church in Thessalonica, right? We shouldn't have to tell the church not to repay evil for evil, but it's here. It's a good word for the church. I'm glad. I'm grateful he did put it in here. Just as a reminder not to get back or seek vengeance against others in the church. Not repaying evil for evil, but always doing good to one another and to everyone. So even if the person who's done you wrong is outside the church or they're not a believer, whatever the situation, you are to give back good uh, for whatever. We go through a few verses here that have some pretty brief statements. So I'm going to read 16 through 22 pretty quick. Rejoice always, always having an attitude of joy. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. I love that statement, praying without ceasing, to be in prayer all the time. Like our, our very lives can be prayer driving around and, and do, running errands and doing chores and getting work done and helping kids at school and whatever else, whatever else we're doing, all of our busyness can be prayer. Now, all that time we spend doing everything, we can be offering prayer to God. Uh, it's, it's just about us and our attitude. 
verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Whether things are going well or poorly, maybe some of your plans are succeeding or they're falling through, whatever the situation is, uh, give thanks to God. And even when things are really at their bottom, we can say, thank you, Lord, for being present with us. When it seems like we're alone, or we're hurting, or we're just down, God is always present with us. We can always give thanks. It's not always easy to say thank you, Lord, in the middle of a difficult time. But he's always there. He's always there, constant presence. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. So we want to remember the Holy Spirit is always with the church and always with believers. Verse 20, do not despise prophecies. And then verse 21, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. So not putting aside a prophetic word in the church, uh, but testing it and seeing if, if truth is being spoken. In verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. And we talked back in the last video for chapter 4 about abstaining from evil. All of these things are, are, I think, very straightforward, easy to understand things, but sometimes difficult for us to do. It can be difficult to give thanks in all circumstances. It can be difficult to abstain from evil. It can be difficult not to repay evil for evil. It's what we're tempted to do. Somebody hurts us, we're tempted to hurt them back. So when Paul reminded the church to continue holy living, to be on the path with Christ because we don't know when Christ is going to come again, when he's going to return, he's trying to tell the church to stay on the right path. And the, this is how we do it. It's how we stay on the right path. And it doesn't say we have to be perfect. It doesn't say we have to do everything correctly. But so much of it is attitude, letting wrongs go, finding reasons to rejoice, giving thanks, constantly praying, not quenching the spirit, but living in the spirit. So much of it is attitude and how open to God are we? Are we seeking that life? Or are we finding reasons to kind of become waylaid, to get set aside? by Christ because we're not following him or his commandments we're just doing our own thing or are we living by his precepts I want to point out uh, the final word about these verses is just that this life sounds pretty good doesn't it if you're on this path even when people do evil to you you do good to them I enjoy doing good for people I think it's it's fun it's fulfilling to do good for others. Rejoicing. Who doesn't want to rejoice? Now, we, we don't always do it. We, we sometimes get grumpy or we look at the negatives and we don't focus on the positives. But rejoicing sounds good for us, right? Praying without ceasing. Drawing ourselves closer to God. Giving thanks. Being full of the Spirit. Hearing prophecies and testing them and hearing the word of God spoken to us. Abstaining from evil. I mean, we may be tempted to do evil things, but I don't think we'd say, boy, I really want evil in my life. I don't want evil to be what my life is about. I want my life to be about good. Doesn't this sound good? Rejoicing and doing good and praying without ceasing and giving thanks. These are all positive things. And the biggest reason why I think we don't do them or we don't live this life that Paul's describing is just we let, we let everything else invade. We don't focus on Christ. We don't focus on the path that leads to him. But we, we let our attention, our gaze go off to the side. We lose sight of the one that is in front of us, the one who is leading us on. Verse 23. Now may the God of peace 
himself sanctify you completely. Paul has an expectation that you can be completely sanctified. And that is deeply rooted in the Methodist heritage, our Methodist church. Deeply rooted in our history. That you can be sanctified completely. Blameless before God. Not because you've done a certain amount of work, but you've let Christ through the Holy Spirit do a certain amount of work in you. And you and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit and soul and body. Do you remember that repeated quotation that from the Old Testament got repeated in the New Testament? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And Jesus repeated it to his disciples and to his enemies. This is imitating that same phrase. This is in Paul's words. May your whole spirit and soul and body be blameless. And I don't know about you, but that's encouraging and it's exciting to me to think about my whole self, soul, body, and spirit. Spirit, soul, and body, as he says, in order. Blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no reason to fear Christ's coming. No reason to fear his return if the church is blameless when he arrives. If we're pure, if we're ready for him, then we can be ready. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. What an encouraging word at the end there, that holiness and blamelessness is a work he does in us. He's going to do it for us. We have to stay on the path, we have to avoid temptation, but he will do this work for us. Verse 25, brothers, pray for us. 26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And verse 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So a final word where Paul asks for them to keep praying for him. Remember our leaders, when you pray at home, when you whatever your prayer life looks like, include your pastor, include our Methodist district superintendent and our bishop, include your leadership. If you're not in the Methodist church and some other faith, include your leadership. Whoever, whoever is in charge of the church, keep praying for us. Our leaders need prayer. We need to be prayed for just like everybody else. Greeting the brothers with a holy kiss, I don't think we're going to make a rule of that at Lacey Spring United Methodist Church. I don't think we're going to ask people to be giving holy kisses to one another. But it's a reaction of affection, right? To, to greet one another affectionately. We should be pleased and excited to see one another. Uh, just, just that joy of seeing a fellow believer and greeting them. In verse 27, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. So he's saying that the letter from him, the letter to the Thessalonians was to be done in public worship, uh, read in a public space, wherever the church was gathered, not kept private, not a private concern for just a few, but for the whole body. And Paul wrote that thinking of the whole church in Thessalonica, I think Paul would be absolutely astounded to know how many Bibles have been printed in our world today, how many different translations, how many different languages this letter appears in. And he is still telling us, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. This letter should be read by everyone in the church. All the brothers and sisters, the entire body, the entire congregation, all churches everywhere should be joyfully celebrating and sharing Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. 
I hope that you've enjoyed reading through these five chapters with me. Next week, we'll start on 2 Thessalonians and continue reading the letters of Paul, at least for a time. And I hope that this study has encouraged you and deepened your faith. Let's pray together as we close this study. Holy God, I want to give you a word of thanks for Paul. I'm grateful today that he wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica, and I'm grateful that you protected it so that the church of my time can read it and learn from it and grow from it. I pray, Lord, that you increase our wisdom and our understanding of your sacred word and that we keep Paul's writings close to our hearts as we seek to live lives that are blameless before you. By your holy name, I pray these things. Amen. Thank you.